Welcome to Tying Michigan's Best Trout Flies. This session we're going to discuss something that I like to call a fly pattern rationale. And since it's mainly conjecture in my personal opinion, but based on over 60 years of observation, I'd like to any and all uh, input that you'd like to give, just to enter it into the comments uh, section and we'll go back and forth on it because I'm sure not everybody sees these things exactly the same way that I do. But to introduce it, let me go back to the year 1954 when I first made my attempts at fly fishing. And I was fishing on a little section of the east branch of Michigan's Osabo River. And I don't remember what fly I was using, but I know that it was a, a riffle section of the river. It's fairly fast moving water. And I wasn't catching any fish. And uh, long about then, an older gentleman came along and watched me for a minute and then uh, offered me a fly from the fleece band on his hat. And I eagerly accepted that, tied it on, threw it out into the riffle water, and caught my first trout on a fly. It was a feisty 10-inch brown trout. I remember it like it was yesterday. And uh, as I later learned, that fly was <clears throat> a brown by visible, which is a perfect fly for that riffle water, really, because it floated uh, really well. And, uh, I'm bringing this up because it kind of leads into this discussion a little bit. It really spurred my interest, not just in the fishing part, but in the fly tying part. So later that year, in the fall, on my ninth birthday, my dad presented me with a fly tying kit, complete with a Thompson A vise, which served me very well for many years and a few other things. And he had a, knew enough about fly tying himself to include certain materials. And unbeknownst to me that he did know how to tie flies. And he gave me my first fly tying demonstration. And what he tied was a Borcher's Special. Now, he tied it the way it was originally tied uh, by Ernie Borcher's. Remember, this was 1954. Ernie died in 1952 at the age of 49. So that fly predates him by quite a bit, probably from the late 30s or early 40s, so the Borcher Special has been around for a long time, and that's the first fly I ever saw tied. I'm bringing that up because I'm going to use a different version of that uh, to discuss fly pattern rationale. At any rate, uh, that was the first fly I ever saw tied. Along with that, my dad gave me, a, uh, with the kit, he gave me an old uh, our herders uh, fly tying and tackle manufacturing manual. I'm not exactly sure that's the name of it, but that was about all we had to, available in those days to actually order uh, materials from, but it also had some fly patterns in it. So I used that quite a bit uh, as well. But that leads me to the Borcher's parachute, which I'm going to use to discuss fly pattern rationale because uh, it's the fly and the vice here. In 1983, I took the Borcher's Special and changed it into a parachute style of fly. Now, why is this fly so successful? Well, I'm going to use this as a reasoning basis for my discussion. There's a lot of other flies that we could use for this, but I picked this one, of course, because it's a Michigan favorite and it's one of mine uh, personally that I adapted and made into a, into a parachute style. So when you take a look at the fly, why, why does this fly catch fish during an emergence and during a spinner fall so successfully? Why, why would that be? Well, I think that the basis for it is what I've come to believe wholeheartedly is that fish see what they want to see. For instance, when you turn this fly around, when you look at it from underneath, you notice the color of it, of course, is dark. It's a, it has mahogany, dark mahogany tones to it. And you'll notice, too, that the fly has, because of the materials that are used, and this deer hair post, it has a natural taper 
from back to front. Now, but it, but when you look at it, does it resemble any merger or a dun? The white wing certainly doesn't. These three long tails uh, certainly don't look like any merger. Uh, but let's look at this again. Dark, tapered, fairly thick up here, and when you one thing you'll you'll notice about fishing hatches is that uh, fish take a lot of floating nymphs during a hatch, and this is my opinion that I think this fly in this during an emergence is likely taken for a floating nymph because of the color and the shape of the body. And you're going to think, well, look at all these three long tails sticking out. That just fortifies my opinion that fish see what they want to see. So we can incorporate these things into, into the construction of our flies. In other words, they're ignoring this because this body part looks like the floating nymph. Uh, and I, I really believe that that's the case. And then, of course, I'm using just this one fly to demonstrate it. But, but now why then is it so successful during the spinnerfall? Again, it's got a white post up here. That doesn't look anything like uh, like a spinner, but but it does have the three long tails like a spinner. It does have the color of these early season flies, for instance, Hendrickson's, Little Mahogany's, Isos, things like that. Similar color. And the parachute hackle, when tied properly and big enough, sticking out the sides, does a nice job of imitating... Uh, spent wings. So here you've got one fly that imitates two stages of the insect quite nicely. It's very successful. Uh, big fish take it just as well as small fish. So, you know, we're not worried about uh, trying to fool the wise old brown trout. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a case, I think, a classic case of fish seeing what they want to see. Now, I know a lot of people don't necessarily agree with that, but but here's something else that I think lends credence to my theory, is that we see we see this hook sticking out here, right? Can the fish see that hook? Uh, no reason to think that they can't. Can they see this part? The eye? No reason to think that they can't. What do they focus on? They focus on the section that looks like food and they readily take the fly. So just some thoughts on fly pattern rationale and and why not keep these in mind when you're constructing your, your own uh, personal flies. You can construct flies that, uh, that take care of more than one phase of any particular insect. So I'd like to get your feedback on that. Uh, of course, we could have used the, any number of different patterns to, to discuss this theory, but I picked this one as I said, for obvious reasons. So, so think about it. Uh, give me some feedback. I'd be interested to have your thoughts on it. And the subsequent flies that we'll be tying in the next couple of videos are going to reflect this line of thinking. They're going to be able to be used to imitate more than one stage of any particular insect. So think about it. Shoot me your comments. And thanks for watching.